So let's go to number six. Artificial sweeteners don't affect your blood sugar. Now, we know that's not true, and science is absolutely confirmed it to be not true. Let's pull up a study here for you. You can see here, um, this, this published just in 2020, effect of artificial sweeteners on insulin resistance among type 2 diabetes patients. Um, the incidence of diabetes has increased over the past few years, mainly due to our eating habits and physical inactivity. This also includes the use of artificial sweetening agents, which have broadly replaced other forms of sugars and have shown a paradoxical negative effect on blood glucose. Ingestion of these artificial sweeteners results in the release of insulin from the pancreas, which is mistaken for glucose due to their sweet taste. This increases the levels of insulin in blood, eventually leading to decreased receptor activity due to insulin resistance. So let's make that, let's turn that into real English. What researchers have found is that using artificial sweeteners, which if you look at most, you know, dietitians and nutritionists and doctors will tell you, you know, use the artificial sweeteners, don't use sugar. Uh, and they'll tell you to use these artificial sweeteners predominantly because they'll tell you they don't affect your blood sugar and that they're non-caloric. So they won't help, you know, increase your weight. But again, in reality, what's happening is these sweeteners effectively make your body resistant to insulin. They cause your body to overproduce insulin. And so over time, you develop an insulin resistance, which is one of the pathways to diabetes and obesity and all the secondary and tertiary problems coming with that, which is predominantly heart disease. So again, if you're one of those and you've been told, you know, drinking Diet Coke is perfectly fine and won't affect your, your blood sugar, um, you've been lied to, right? And most of this comes from the industry. And I'm, again, I don't want to too terribly come down on doctors because they don't study nutrition. You should know that, by the way. Doctors don't study nutrition, so really most doctors aren't qualified, not all, but most are not qualified to really discuss nutritional components with you. So most people don't know that. They go into their doctor's office and, and um, you know, they think their doctor understands nutrition because they went to medical school. But in reality, medical school has very little, almost no nutritional education. And so your doctor, again, not qualified to have that conversation with you to any huge degree unless they've gone on to do additional training or certification. But this is, again, this is a classic example where the industry, and if we look at who promotes these products, these artificial sweeteners, and, uh, and creates the lie, the big lie, which is they don't affect your blood sugar, they, they're safe for diabetics, uh, that's industry, right? And the power of that industry and the power they have to run commercials and ads and advertising and to influence policy to influence healthcare providers is tremendous. And you just have to be aware of that because at the end of the day, with everything that we're talking about, it really boils down to follow the money. You know, if there's money to be made uh, in lying, um, you, can, you, can, you can bet that somebody's gonna lie. We're gonna be lied to. And, uh, and people, many people are gonna pay a price for those lies until we figure out they're paying a price. So again, um, the lesson here is artificial sweeteners are bad for you. They do affect your blood sugar. They do contribute to insulin sensitivity, and you should not be under any guise that they're somehow healthier for you uh, because they're calorie-free. Um, artificial sweeteners, no good. Okay, let's talk about number seven. Trust the science. Now, in medicine, um, I want to show you just some recent publications that have come out of the journal Science. Again, trust the science. This, this was published in Science. Um, hidden conflicts. Pharma payment to FDA advisors after drug approvals spark ethical concerns. No kidding. Ethical concerns. So the very doctors who are supposed to be the gatekeepers of honesty and safety and integrity in medicine are the very ones that are taking kickbacks and dollars from the companies they're supposed to be regulating. A lot of people have the impression that, you know, the FDA and the CDC um, are infallible institutes uh, where truth reigns. And the reality is we've known about these conflicts, you know, for decades. They've been problems. Um, this isn't me talking about it. It isn't the first time you've probably heard about it. But um, it's not a little known fact that 
there's a revolving door between agencies like the FDA and pharmaceutical companies. When, generally speaking, a lot of times what happens is drug companies will submit their drugs to the FDA for approval. The very people working the approval process have a desire to go make a fat salary working for the pharmaceutical company. So what do they do? They favorably approve drugs. In some cases, you know, the big question mark is should the drug have ever even have been approved? Was it actually safe or was that doctor on the dole? And um, ethics and morals at play, bad ethics and bad morals. And this is part of the problem because you don't ever know how honest these professionals are being when they're being paid by the very industry they're supposed to regulate. So again, science has talked about this conflict of interest numerous times. You can see here in this second piece, FDA's revolving door. Companies often hire agency staffers who manage their successful drug reviews. Um, it, it's, it's a huge problem in the industry. We've all known about it. Nobody's willing to do anything about it. You know, um, politics, right? Politicians generally are also probably taking uh, money for their campaigns from the pharmaceutical industry. So there's really no huge, great desire to police uh, this hugely flawed system with the potential for massive corruption and honestly with the potential for the massive ability to create major damage. You know, so for that reason, you, you have to look at, you know, these regulatory agencies um, and you have to take what they say with a huge grain of salt because um, although they should be out for your best interests, your tax dollars are paying their salary, many of them have a different and more nefarious purpose, which is, you know, to move on and become a higher paid industry shill, so to speak. So you have to really, you know, you have to really judge the information that's coming out of these agencies far more today than, than maybe even particularly in the past. Let's move on to number eight. Organic food isn't important. You know, I hear this argument a lot um, that organic food um, is no better than regular conventional food and that pesticides are safe um, and that we can't grow our food without pesticides and feed the people of the world. And I would argue very much differently. Um, we, act, we don't have a food shortage in this, in this country or actually even in the world. We have an overabundance of food. As a matter of fact, a lot of, a lot of years the government pays farmers to destroy food or to not grow food. So again, it's not an issue that we don't have enough. A lot of it has to do with commodity price control and nothing really to do with you know, feeding starving people or, or you know, having technology to grow more food to feed starving people. Um, and then you have industry influence because a lot of farming is, is obviously is influenced by the GMO seed companies and the, and the GMO pesticide companies. So you know, you've got that undue influence that's also playing a role. But if we look at the research on um, organics, Let's just look at what we've got here. Organic diet intervention significantly reduces urinary pesticide levels in U.S. children and adults. So this, this you know, published recently in the Environment, Journal of Environmental Research. Um, you know, coming down here to the conclusion, an, orga an, an organic diet was associated with significant reductions in urinary excretion of several pesticide metabolites in parent compounds. This study adds to a growing body of literature indicating that an organic diet may reduce exposure to a range of pesticides in children and adults. And remember what we said earlier about the war against cancer. I mean, this is a perfect example of tying that back in. We know that many pesticides are carcinogenic. We know they're problematic. And some of the ones even that are improved, approved, if we look historically at a lot of the pesticides that were, improved at, uh, uh, that were approved in the past, many of them were banned as a result of cancer. And we have a lot of that same thing going on today that the, the, the pesticide creation companies are pretty tricky. They come out with new versions so that you know, we can't get validity as to whether or not they cause cancer yet. And then it takes a decade or so to finally realize that the problem, uh, the problem is actually there. So again, pesticides, very potentially problematic. Eating organic reduces the exposure. It may not be perfect. Organic, there may be some people that cheat it. There may be some sprays and residues that are found in organic foods, but by far research shows that there's a tremendous difference quantitatively in the 
amount of pesticide exposure you get organic versus non-organic food. And then um, we also go down here, you know, pulling this up off of uh, National Institute of Health, toxic, toxic exposure to pesticides can result in short and long-term health effects. Immediate effects can include nose and throat irritation, nausea and dizziness, while prolonged effects can result in conditions such as asthma, certain types of cancers, cognitive impairment, as well as reproductive health problems. We've also seen the, the linkage of pesticides to a number of different types of autoimmune diseases, especially neurological autoimmune diseases. So again, organic is better. It's worth the cost. Your health is worth it. And don't let anybody tell you differently. Okay, let's go to number nine. Chiropractic is dangerous. This is a message we've heard you know, the propaganda since the 60s and 70s, you know, don't go see a chiropractor, they'll, they'll kill you, um, they'll stroke your neck. Um, this propaganda has been fostered upon um, mainstream for, for decades, and all in the name of safety, right? Chiropractors are dangerous, they're quacks, we've all heard that message. I, by trade, am a chiropractor, I have a chiropractic degree, among others. And so, um, I wanted to educate you a little bit about how just untrue that actually is. Um, one is I want to make you aware of a lawsuit that occurred, uh, Wilk versus the AMA. This was a lawsuit that, um, that occurred a number of decades ago. It was a chiropractor who actually sued the American Medical Association. Why? Because the AMA was purposefully creating false propaganda and statements against chiropractic, things that were totally untrue in an effort to monopolize healthcare. Their goal was to eradicate any other form of alternative medicine, not just chiropractic, but also naturopathic medicine and, and uh, acupuncture. And again, most forms of alternative medicine today are alternative, not because they should be, they're alternative because that's what we've been told by a very corrupt group of people who systematically set out to destroy alternative medicine because it played a threat to their bottom line. And so you can see here in this study published, it was, a, it was actually it's a multi-part series, but you can see the AMA actions included influencing mainstream media, decisions made by the Joint Commissions on Accreditation of Hospitals. So they influenced the media, the hospitals, the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, other actions included publishing propaganda against chiropractic and implementing an anti-chiropractic program aimed at medical students, medical societies, and the American public. After more than a decade of overt and covert actions, the AMA chose to end its committee on quackery the following year documents exposed the extent of AMA's efforts to enact its boycott of chiropractic. You can read more about that. There's a really great book published called Wilk versus the AMA. Very, very enlightening on the corruption within the AMA and their, and their design to destroy an entire profession for no other reason that they wanted the business. And you know, if we're looking at it by the numbers, I, I, I thought I'd also show you a few other things. So this, you know, Chiropractic is not dangerous. If you want to look, um, follow the money, so to speak, this is a, a diagram on, on malpractice insurance premiums that doctors pay for. And if you look at chiropractic, uh, this is, these are annual malpractice premiums. A chiropractor pays about $1,600 a year for malpractice insurance. And you know, insurance companies usually have their, their dollars dialed in pretty tight or they would go out of business. So again, the higher the risk of danger, the more the malpractice insurance costs. You can see of all doctors, chiropractic on the bottom of the list, lowest, meaning the safest. And then you go into psychiatry at 5,000, which is, you know, psychiatry, a lot of that is talk medicine nowadays as opposed to, um, you know, risky, risky drugs or surgeries. And then you have family medicine paying about 10,000, internal medicine 14, anesthesiology 15,000, radiology 21,000, surgeons 34,000, and OB-GYNs 46,000. So again, of all, the, of all the different types of doctor specialties, you know, from a safety perspective, just following the numbers from malpractice insurance, chiropractic definitely on the low end, the lowest end of that. And then if you look also at death rates in the US. This study recently published 
um, this was a few years ago now, in, in British Medical Journal, in the British Medical Journal, found that uh, medical era was the third leading cause of death, which is quite alarming and quite scary when you consider um, heart disease is number one, cancer is number two. You know, the way we treat heart disease predominantly, the way we treat cancer predominantly is with medicine. And medicine and medical era is the third leading cause of death. There's actually an incident in California years ago where medical doctors went on strike and the death rates went down. Um, again, this isn't, this isn't me trying to damn all of medicine. It's simply um, trying to inform you that there's, there's risks inherent Chiropractic has much less risk uh, than mainstream medicine. And the outcomes in many cases are much, much better. And I think, um, especially if you look historically at, um, at drug-induced deficiency side effects, at um, medication-induced deaths, even from what we would consider to be benign medications, aspirin kills about 13,500 people a year, opiates, prescription and um, illegal massive deaths, over 17,000 deaths a year. Um, and that's just, those are just two different medications out of thousands of different medications. We have huge risk associated with using medicines. That's why when you, when you get exposed to all these drug commercials at night watching news or TV, you know, the guy at the end has to talk like an auctioneer, you know, a thousand words a minute to ramble through all the side effects. Um, and now we've got drugs that treat the side effects of other drugs that are being marketed uh, and used. So again, it's, um, it's, become, it's become a big problem because we spend about $4 trillion a year on medical treatments in this country. And uh, many of those could be resolved if we would have the resolve to look at diet and lifestyle, not as alternatives, but as primary care in, in health. And I think when we start doing that, um, you know, we'll save the American taxpayer and probably any other industrialized country that's going in this same direction, um, trillions of dollars a year in expenses.